this is the 26th uh, September and uh, Sarah is going to uh, make a report to us about the paper that John Connor's family left us. Sarah, thank you. GRG 26 and 1995. Remembering the late, the late John Connell, a governed lad from Harmony Road, John was a member of the GRG for a considerable period of time, probably at the club's inception. He was born about 1910 and had a great love and knowledge of the area. He was an only child whose parents had suffered the loss of four daughters before John was born. This fact he told me about himself was when we had a cup of tea together on my, in my council house in Govan. He also told me of the early death of his wife, whom he had married probably after the war. The GRG meant a lot to John, who was a regular attender at the group meetings and was grateful for the friendship which he received there. He also wrote articles on many subjects for recording and some for the production of the group's yesteryear's magazine. So he left something for posterity. He continued later to write much more on various subjects. I believe John was a shipyard worker and who during the war volunteered to join the army in 1940 and served in the home front. Later he was posted out to the Far East campaign and suffered quite considerably by the Japanese and where he was forced to work under atrocious and human conditions in the building of the Kwai Bridge. Fortunately he survived amongst the lucky few, but he said seldom mentioned much about this time of his life. In spite of all his misfortunes and misery, John was never self-pitying, arrogant nor conceited. Recently the GRG have had some of John's writings donated which consists of essays, some poetry, and observations on school days, his enthusiasm for, enthusiasm for football and his support of his favourite team, namely Partick Thistle Club. His wish to be top pupil, pupil in school instead of second best. He recollected very well some interesting pieces of information on the governed area, for example, changes in street names disappearance of works, trades, shops and many businesses. John was good company and clever. News of John's death on April 1993 was given by John's relatives in Maryhill to Mr. Tommy Stewart, chairman of the GRG, who told us all the sad news. Those of us who knew John Connell will never forget him and his de dedication to the place of his birth and to government. Many friends and family attended his funeral in the Mary Hill area. From the GRG were Tommy Stewart, Sarah Halley, Fiona McGowan, a student, and Rob Gold, now in the USA. Dozens of friends, neighbours to say goodbye to an honest, kindly man. That is all. A well-known landmark vanished also in 1923 when Tenet's stock was demolished. It was 453 feet high. On Fair Sunday, every, everybody had flocked to see city landmarks when for a day the city was almost smokeless. People carried not field glasses but opera glasses and velvet lined cases. In the streets were the appearance of wireless shops as they were then known, the absence of silk hats, the flood of bowlers, even every office boy wore them, even though they were starting wage was 10 shillings a week old money. A slight slimming down of ladies' outlines. The most notable change in the 1920s was the new housing schemes all around the city. After 1920, no school child could be seen going barefoot to school as it was illegal to send the child to school barefoot or unwashed. At the height of the Charleston craze, no one looked twice at a girl if her knees were showing. In 19, 1926, an all-black American show introduced slacks to the street scene. There was still a large amount of horses traffic and dirty streets, streets around the dock area about 11 p.m. In the, in the yards, engineers were still recognised by their skip caps, but the labourers were still dressed in duds as few could afford dungarees. Before fridges became common after WW2, there was ne nearly a rush to the shops, and milk boys were noted for their shrill whistling, long handles on their cans, 
a long established custom of the 30s died with the war and that was the Sunday night parade of the youth in the city and their Sunday best along the approaches to the city. Renfrew Road, Dumbarton, Great Western Road, Duke Street, London Street, Shettleson Road to mention a few. Details of this custom of getting clicks can be read about in the Scots magazine for June and July 1995. Nobody under 40 will have seen the overhead cables for power to the trams, where today only their supports remain in walls. Will the child of the future look back on the sight of TV aerials and TV dishes, or reflect on some surveillance cameras and think about Charlie Chaplin in modern times where he goes to the toilet for a quick draw and the screen lights up and the boss cries, get back to your work. Or perhaps lift to see many crosses in the city with their quota of unemployed. Street changes to mention has been made determining the age of the buildings today. There's distinct date types dating from TE, 1850s, 70s, 80s, 1890s, Edwardian post-World War or to who I am referring to architecture on the disappearance of chimneys falling in smokeless areas. The end of the drinking fountains from the parks, who remembers a keep off the grass notices, nobody under 50 years of age. Do you remember Market Collins the 26th of 1995? I remember the miners strike right in the early 70s. I was working in Ryan's Bakery at the time and I had to start an hour early as you never knew when the power would be cut off. If you're operating a machine when this happened, it could be a, be a nightmare trying to clean it without any power, as it had to be done manually, which was a lot harder and more dangerous. My aunt had an electric cooker, which meant that you had to get your meals before the, the power was cut off. We had a coal fire heating the house, but I can't remember if there was any difficulty in getting some supplies. I lived in the Govan Road at the time, and one night one of the neighbours came to tell us that the parish priest in St Anthony's was selling church candles to the people in the area. There was a shortage of candles because the factory who made them had to close too. The people, the people thought this was a great thing for the priest to do, as there was two eight candles left in the church after he sold them all. I walked the whole length of Govan Road in the dark, carrying a holy candle in my hand. My aunt was quite happy to see I had one, as ours was running out. I also remember the Queen telling Ted Heath's Tory government that she didn't want any power cuts on the day of her daughter's wedding. Sure enough, there were none on Princess Anne's wedding, which, by the way, never bought her any work. Many members of the public were not very happy with this. There was a funny thing that happened to a friend. He decided to put Foy on a shovel and cooked some sausages on a coal fire. When they were done, he carefully took the shovel off the fire, but as he did this, the sausages rolled onto the fire and were burnt. The air was turned blue as he didn't see the funny side. We were all falling about laughing. He walked out in a huff and was not seen again for over two hours. Remember, the fire alarms are metal keys with glasses on most street corners. In the event of a fire, you could knock on that. And very promptly, fire brigade came from Orkney Street. Uh, the street lights in those days were quite novel too. Just don't forget, in many homes in our own govern, we still had gas with the gas mantles. But it was quite novel to see the man turning the handle and the whole cage of the street lighting coming down. And to young boys and girls, it appeared as though it was too pencils touching each other that caused the light. Do you remember the suction van that came round, opened up the drain, and whenever they took the water away into the main tank, they left soil on the, the roadway, and there was a search there for pennies, because again, you were in a period when people were getting married, and uh, for good luck, you had to throw as many pennies and hatenies out the window. Uh, the street traders, these were quite novel, these fellas. They went away up to the fish market, the fruit market, and uh, even the newspapers had men going round the street shouting, hey, uh, extra, extra, and I can remember the first time this came to mind the, uh, the Duke of Windsor, whenever he resigned from the throne. Um, Stairhead lawyers, this was always a man that knew all about it, he was quite well respected because he did help many, many people, 
and very few people could afford solicitors in any case. Down at the police station in Otley Street, it was quite normal to see photographs of the notice wanted in detail. read from a piece of paper. <laughs> um, we also had, of course, uh, that scene at the police station, and it was a novel to look at those faces of the men, most of them with a crew cut haircut, and were really uh, villains of the past, and uh, rewards were quite often. The money lenders in the street, of course, they were, you found one in almost every street, and you generally found that you had a brother who was the bookmaker that stood in the clothes, took bets, and uh, if they had a lady in that clothes, there was always a big uh, letterbox, and the idea was that when someone said the slops, uh, he ran through the clothes, took the notes or the chits uh, with the horses and everything else, and put them through the, uh, the letterbox. That lady's rent was paid for by uh, the bookmaker. The man that we can never forget, of course, was the school board. This was a man in a uniform who went to all the schools, got to know who were the children that were off, and he seemed to search in and around the area and if he caught you, he would take you back to the school as though it was like something uh, out of the, uh, the, the River Clyde. Uh, I always remember the period when the fortune tellers came to the door. My mother, of course, uh, was an individual and she wanted to buy that little piece of white heather. It wasn't until many years later on I discovered that you can get white heather by just dipping ordinary heather into bleach. I uh, feel that perhaps, too, that the traditional fish and chip supper that was always a Friday and Saturday night might be that that was when you got your brew money or your parish money as it was known at that time because these shops didn't have any fridges if you went early in the day you got one fish with chips for thruppings but uh, if you wanted a second fish it had to be four as the night went on he knew that he wasn't going to be able to sell the fish so you got as many chips and fish uh, for thruppings the fact that it caused for the property uh, he went round every day, sorry, every week, and he was knocking on that door, of course, there was many a time, whatever, the joke that we heard many people relating to, that when the wee kid went to the door, my, my mummy says that she's no win. Trams in the fog, these were quite a feature, you know, that, uh, they could travel the, the length and breadth of Glasgow because they were on rails, and they were more more dependable than anything else, because, as I say, you could have a tram, one for every minute, that was what... Uh, the director of transport boasted at that time. The dest dentist, if you had a teeth, by the way, it was giving you hell, you had to go along with a six mini piece. That was what it happened. And of course, in most cases, he drew it out without any form uh, of painkillers or anything else. Moonlights or flittings. Because of the economic situation at the time, many of the people in and around the government area couldn't afford the rent, they ran up their rears and then everything was bumped into a pram and they always had the moonlight. They made the move and that was it. One of the features which I envy at the present time is that you had, had a shillingly trip. You went to Central Station and they would take you for a shilling. You generally ended up doing at sea mills, salt coats or at large. And as such, a, uh, you could feel that in some way uh, this was all part of the life of the so-called good old days. On Derby Day, you always had the man who had that radio. Radio? Well, it was known as a crystal set, and it was not uncommon to see a whole backyard where a group of men round it. He had the headphones on and given a, a repeat of what was being told about the actual race itself. The caps that uh, Sarah was talking about, I think it was Sarah, I remember if you bought a cap, you also had a cane. There was a flexible cane on the inside, and this was the idea to keep it in a rounded shape. Well, I told you about the weddings. The gas man, well, he was a fellow that came and had that marvellous key of opening the brass lock and pulled out the pennies, and the whole family were round the table as he counted out the shillings, and you always seemed to get a dividend. Of course, it was not unknown that there were people putting steel washers into the uh, meter and getting gas. Gas in those days, of course, was that was a form of heating uh, and also a form of illumination because your mother, she was lucky if she had one of those big stoves with the oven on the side and I'll always remember that it had been on any length of time when she was making a plate of stoveys. As she opened the door, you could feel that heat coming out and hitting you on the face. In the local uh, shop, there was a new thing came. It was just like a big bottle of gas, metal gas, 
and uh, the man put coloured water into a, a tumbler and it was called Avantis. That was better than perhaps what we could afford. Someone mentioned about bare feet. Well, I can remember the days whenever uh, you were away from school, you took the good shoes or sand shoes or boots off and you were able to walk about the, free, about the street because most streets in and around Govan, they were all cobbles. There were only one flat street and that was down uh, towards the Elder Cinema. That was where all the kids with uh, roller skates went down and they beginning to do all kinds of tricks round about there. But above all, who can forget the big exhibition in the uh, uh, Bellahousen, organised by the Daily Record, and they formed what was known as the Chum Club. The Chum Club also gave you a badge on your lapel, and you were really somebody if you had a, a, a Chum Club badge. The New Year's was quite unique. It was not uncommon as we approached the midnight. The windows were thrown open, and if you had one of those old-fashioned uh, gramophones with a big 12-inch record, you turned it out in there. What is uh, frightening at the present time, we don't hear any of the horns. The horns in the workshops are from the ships that were tied up in the uh, actual uh, river itself. And then, of course, as the war came along, the sad scene that we did we watch was the telegram boy on the bike delivering the telegrams to people who had perhaps lost their sons or their sons were missing and everything else. I feel that perhaps there's a few memories there, Jim, of the Probably the first one uh, I can remember uh, that sticks in my mind is the being in Dunoon uh, in 1914 and my uncle, who was probably about four years older than I was, coming in with a Sunday post screaming, War's declared, war's declared, and my mother telling them off it was nothing good about war. I also remember at that particular time the soldiers parading in the front at the noon prom and watching the building of the boom across the Clyde. Uh, Andy brought some memories back to me too about uh, the, the 20s. Uh, one of the I do remember is the 1919-1920 minor strike when they were digging for coal in Oak Creighton Road. Uh, and of course, people of my age and Andy's, probably a lot of people younger than me, will remember that Coven was built more or less on old mine workings. Uh, I can tell you that when I worked in Harland and Wolf at Clyde Foundry, that uh, the police came to the office one day and said that uh, we better go and investigate an accident. And uh, we owned all that ground at the back of Clyde Foundry practically from Craigton Road to Helen Street. When I say we, I mean Harland and Wolf. And uh, when we got there, we discovered that there was a number of people who used to keep their horses and carts there. And in this particular instance, one of the old carters from government went up and discovered there was a big hole. And his horse and cart were down the hole, and that was where the shaft had sunk. And uh, they never recovered it, they just had to fill it up. The other thing I do recall, uh, going back to the First World War, is my aunt coming from, or my grand aunt actually, coming from Edinburgh, where they brought down the Zeppelin. I can never remember whether they brought it down in the middle of Edinburgh or in the outskirts of Edinburgh, but she again, she was all excited too. I can't imagine it could have been in the middle of Edinburgh on Princess Street because the place would have gone in fire because it the envelope was full of helium gas or some kind of gas but I remember her stories about people running about and cheering and all the rest of it the two things I do remember too is the difference in the street, somebody was talking about I think it was said talking about washing down the streets, I can remember them washing down the streets at night time and uh, I remember the the, the horses truck at the corner of Langlands Road and Elder Street where the horses used to drink they, on their rounds but uh, perhaps one of the things I do remember in relation to the vandalism and murders that goes about today as I can recall the two gangs in Govan the Kelly Bows and the Redskins and I remember on a Saturday night 
coming up home from a pictures uh, and seeing this crowd and the shouting and standing up on the wall and holding on to railings at Hill Trust School and watching the two gangs fighting in the middle of Langlands Road and people walking up and down the pavements that were quite unconcerned because it was a feature of gangland in those days it never interfered with people who weren't in the gangs they always just fought each other uh, and, and Govan, despite it all, was uh, it's a safe place to, to live in, uh, despite the myths. Uh, one of the myths in my day was uh, a person called Flannel Feet. We used to sing a song about Flannel Feet. But uh, I don't need to get into the song. But uh, they, these, these were things that I remember. Uh, Andy referred to the New Year, where all the all the shipyards, all, every engineering shop, I can remember the wee silt mill in Govan had a wee squeaky one. As soon as it was 12 o'clock, the, all the bells rang. Not, not, not all the bells, some of the church bells rang, but all the horns in the shipyards and the engineering shops rang out the, the new year. And uh, referring to the new year, I can remember that a lot of people used to go up to Glasgow Cross for there was a statue of King Billy at Glasgow Cross. As soon as the bells rang, they used to pelt it by their empty whiskey bottles. And that was one of the reasons why it was shifted, as a matter of fact. But we used to sing a song about that as well, which I won't go into. But uh, Govan in Glasgow was, was a safe place to live. When I think about it now, uh, sometimes I'm even scared to go out at night. Uh, but uh, when I hear, when I go to an, an art class and hear some of the ladies are speaking there and they talk about they never go out at night, and I think back in the days of Govan, even the the Kelly Bows and the Redskins, at least you could walk about Govan. And uh, yeah, I, I don't recall even seeing windows broken. They probably were. Boys were boys at every age, but I honestly don't remember windows being broken or slogans. Well, to say slogans is not true, uh, because at uh, election time, the, the various parties painted the pavements. Uh, I've done my share of that and getting chased by the police as well. But uh, you never saw vandalism like you see today. So that uh, I don't know uh, what's happened to education, uh, but uh, children seem to me to be a different kind of breed. It's not necessarily their fault. I think their fault lies a great deal with conditions. The parents probably have never worked in their lives as a result of the economic conditions. But uh, change days from the days that I was at school. There's one thing Andy was talking about you brought back a memory. There was one year I went, I used to go to Cessna to my cousins for New Year. And this one New Year, uh, people next door Davis says, there's a call to out in Cessnock, praying the bang pipes. So we thought we could no one. So we went out and discovered there was a call to praying bang pipes in uh, Cessnock. Then everybody got into a big ring. We were all dancing around each other. People were bringing out shortbread, uh, sandwiches, ginger, and uh, the priests. And everybody was out the windows. It was just about the good old days, as you, you were talking about and uh, people were uh, sharing the stuff all around and the, the, the priests were just walking by, coming back in the car says, oh well, she's having a good time, no problem, they didn't bother. But it, it was really a great night. The funny thing is the boy was really away with it. He had visited someday uh, in Glasgow and he couldn't get the last train and he ended up staying in Glasgow, it was three hours. And it was the best New Year I'd ever had. After wading through and seeing the enthusiasm of our members mentioning life as it was many, many years ago, what comes to mind here is the 11th of November of every year where buses, trams and every form of transport stop for a minute in recognition of the end of the Great War. Even in those days, the funeral undertaker marched alongside the hearse. It wasn't as his present time. You will get it up there and burn it as quick as possible. And of course, poverty was a right... A, really a, a feature in many, many homes and it was not unusual to say that the only time you had fruit in the house was whenever with someone ill. My grandmother, she learned, my, my wife and perhaps my mother too, eh, how to make curds and whey. 
when she sent you around to the com- chemist shop for rennet and uh, that. He, uh, the old man, my father, he used to get me around about February or March, which was my birthday, and I had a bit of greasy paper with a yellow substance in it, and it was known as sulphur, and I spent a spoonful of uh, treacle into that, and it was made into a ball. I was told to open my mouth, and that'll do you good, and it'll get rid of all the boils in the back of your neck. These were things, you know, that we can afford to remember. But 